You know, as we kick off this series about resisting the devil, I'm curious. At, a, at an important time in your life, any moment that's, that's important to you, have you ever had someone speak some words to you and they're trying to help you, but deep down what they say, it, it don't help at all? I, I remember a time I was the best man in a wedding and that moment, 15 minutes before the ceremony is about to begin, the best man typically goes back and hangs out with the groom and they, they sort, of, so, sort of share some sentimental memories or, or tell some jokes. And it's just a really, really special time. So I went back with the groom and when I got back there and I saw the groom, like this was not a good scene. He was, he was pale white, he was sweating. I saw a paper bag on the ground because he was, he was hyperventilating. He was so anxious and panic stricken about what was to take place. I looked over to my right and I thought, this isn't good. There's an exit there. There's a door there. And I literally thought, okay, we're going to be on the scene of a movie like Runaway Bride. He, he has an exit here. So I slowly like make my way over between him and the exit because I don't want anything bad to go down. And in that moment, I'm thinking, gosh, what do I do? And in, in that moment, thankfully, the minister walked in. And I'm thankful in that moment because I'm, I'm like, great, a professional is here. He, he's going to know what to say. He's going to know how to say it and everything is going to be better. So I look at the groom, I look at the minister and the minister notices something's up, something's off. This isn't normal right before a wedding. And so he looks at the groom, he says, what's wrong? And the groom starts telling him about his anxiety and his fears and, and the things he's panicked about and why he's sweating so bad and why there's no color, like zero color in his face. And after he's done talking, he looks at the minister and the minister like looks at him and he goes like this, like scowls almost. Don't be nervous. And he turns around and walks away. That's literally what he said at a moment of sheer terror and panic for the room. All he said was, well, don't be nervous. Like how much did that help in that moment? I go back to my own life. I remember when I was in high school and I was playing baseball and all of a sudden, if you know baseball, you know something called the baseball yips. It's when you can't make short throws and you don't know why. You're good with long throws, but really, really short throws for some reason between your ears, like something's going on and you, you just can't make the throw. And I could not throw as a catcher. I could not throw the ball back about 40 feet to the pitcher after every pitch. It's kind of important. You catch a lot of pitches. You got to throw the ball back to the pitcher. Well, I remember one time it hit me really, really hard. There was a runner on first. There were two outs in the inning and, and I receive a ball and the runner notices that I'm having trouble throwing. So he tries to steal. I throw an absolute laser to second base. The ball beats him there. He's tagged out. The inning is over. I go off the field and my coach looks at me and he goes, you're out. Throw it right. I'm thinking like inside, like, like, what do you think I've been trying to do? Those words, they're not, they're not helpful at all. In those moments, like, like what's going through my mind, I'm thinking like, gee, thanks, Captain Obvious. You really saved the day. You helped me a ton. You see, in those moments, when someone says words that ultimately aren't really helpful, when you tell me what to do without telling me how to do it, deep down inside, all I'm feeling is frustration toward you. And frustration is a really, really kind word for what I'm feeling. You know what I'm talking about. Like when someone looks at you and just says, do better. Move on. Just, just forgive them. Hey, forget about it. It'll be better next time. Just, just go and get a job, would you? Just, just ask her out. 
Like, what are you worried about? Just go and ask her out. And these phrases that we hear over and over and over again, do they really, really help? I was thinking about this concept in this series and this idea of resist. And, and instantly, it's where my mind goes a lot. I, I thought about The Office you know, the greatest television show ever known to, to humankind. In season five, there's a character named Stanley and he experiences a heart attack. And there's, there's like sheer pandemonium in the office because they, they're not really sure how to respond and how to be first responders and, and administer CPR. And, and after the moment, Michael, in a cameo in front of the camera, he says these words. He says, in the moment, I, 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 really, I knew what to do, but in another deeper sense, I really had no idea what to do. You see, I think that's what goes on in our hearts and minds when we bump into things like greed or lust or fear or temptation to control. When we're tempted to, to respond out of anger, when, when something triggers us deep down inside, when we're tempted to cross a moral boundary because something's going on inside that we want to end or something that we want to satisfy when we feel like we need to please people to get what we want, when we feel like we need to assert ourselves to become more significant, when we need to perform, when we need to control, a lot of times we know what to do, but in some cases, we don't really know how to do it. Like we know what's right, but we don't always know how to do what's right. There's a quote that's attributed to Mahatma Gandhi. And it's a quote that really is just, it's disturbing me. And it's sobering my mind and my heart as I think about this concept of just how do we resist the devil? Here's what he said. He said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. You see, if we navigate this world and all we know is what to do, but never really understand how to do it, we won't really look like Jesus, will we? We won't really step into this beautiful identity and purpose and calling that has been placed upon us. You see, to understand what it looks like to really know, experience, and follow Jesus, it's knowing more than just what to do. It's actually understanding and applying how to do it. And that's what this entire series is all about. Because so many times in life, I think we know that we're supposed to just resist the devil. And we know that scripture promises us that when we do that, he'll flee from us. But the question is, are we more like Michael Scott than we'd like to admit? Like deep down in a much more real sense, do we really know how to resist the devil? This is a phrase in a passage of scripture from James chapter four that we're gonna be looking at for the next nine weeks. This is an entire series that we're covering, one main passage of scripture because this concept is so important to living victoriously as a follower of Jesus. Because the attacks of the enemy, the temptations from the devil, the storms of life, they come. And the key to resisting is knowing how to resist. So to kick our time off today, I wanna to read this passage of scripture and we're gonna be covering it every single week as we navigate through this series. Here's what it says. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Beautiful promise, right? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble, your, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Resist the devil and he will flee for you. See, here's what we're gonna be doing in this series. It's sort of broken up over nine weeks into three main parts. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to the beginning of the Bible and we're gonna look at what went wrong. Like, why do we even have to resist in the first place? And what is it deep down inside that we're resisting in terms of the devil's attack? Then we're actually gonna take a look at scripture and what he says about our enemy. We're gonna look at and uncover what are the devil's tactics? Because if we know how he attacks, how he prowls around, we can better resist him when that time comes. And then finally, we're gonna take time and we're gonna look at Jesus who himself 
resisted the devil. And listen, when Jesus promises us that all authority on earth that that had been given to him, he now gives it to us, what we get to do in those moments to step into his authority is look at Jesus and imitate him. And that's how we resist. So as we kick this series off for the first four weeks, we're gonna be looking at what went wrong. And here's the big idea today as we dive into just how do we resist the devil? Here's the big idea. Knowing the target makes it easier to resist an attack. Like if you know where the attack is coming, you can see it sooner and be ready more so in your heart. As I mentioned, we're gonna go all the way back to the beginning. We're gonna go back to the creation account that we read in Genesis. And, and here's how it goes. Many of us know what happens. In the beginning of the scriptures, God, God is creating. And, 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 and what, what's happening here is that it's the very, very first point for the, the grand scheme of, of the arc of scripture that we read about. See, scholars would determine and describe scripture in four main parts. Creation, fall, redemption, that's referring to the cross, Jesus on the cross, and then restoration, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And what's interesting about those four main sections and descriptors of, of the arc of, of Scripture, the first two of them, they happen in three chapters. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 detail the account of both creation and fall. And so to understand what went wrong and what it is that we're actually resisting, it's really, really important to dig in often to the very beginning of Scripture. So here's how it goes. We know that that God was creating. And if you know Genesis chapter 1, you know that, that oftentimes God describes his creation as good. And most times when you and I, when we think about the word good, we think it's something awesome. It's something that we enjoy. And, and if God is calling it good, maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit extra awesome. But you got to understand, deep down, there, there's real significant meaning to the word good that we read about in the scriptures, especially when it's used to describe us. God's chief creation, man and woman. Here's what it says in Genesis 1, 31. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, with man and woman in it, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. You know what the word used in the scriptures? It's a Hebrew word called tov. And what tov refers to, it's more than just what you and I would say after we eat a meal that was good. Tov is referring to every manner of goodness known to human beings. This is, this is when you feel like you are flourishing in this world. That's what tov is like. It's, it's all goodness wrapped up in one. Sometimes words fail to describe what tov is expressing here in the scriptures. It's actually referring to when things are functioning the way they were designed and intended to function. I think about the difference between tov and, and just good, like our everyday average word. It, it's the fall right now. It's about to be one of the best times of the year because it's time for postseason baseball. If you're a baseball fan, you look forward to this time. And I love tuning in and watching the baseball playoffs and eventually the World Series. I'm just a baseball nut and I love it. And to me, the baseball playoffs, they are good. But when the Pirates are in the playoffs, that's tov. See, as a Pirates fan, that's the way it was intended to be. The Pirates are intended every single year to, to contend for and then win a World Series. That's my idea of Tove and flourishing and the way things are supposed to function. And this is what was happening in the garden in Genesis 1 and 2. You know who was experiencing Tove? We were. Like there's a very, very special, special experience called flourishing in the garden before the fruit entered and before the serpent tempted Adam and Eve to eat and to sin. Like think about it. When, when you look at the scriptures, you notice that Adam and Eve, they had these things. I like to call them attributes. They were automatically significant. Like, like they had dominion over all the earth. Like how much more significance can you have than that? Adam and Eve had these attributes of, of acceptance. They walked with God himself every single day. Like they hung out with God in the garden. Matter of fact, they were created in his own image. Talk about automatic acceptance. It's an attribute. Not only did they have the attribute of significance and of acceptance, they also had the attribute of security. Like they didn't have to worry about provisions. 
They didn't have to worry about purpose or, or losing their job and finding a new career and understanding like, like what was I designed to do? No, they had it there. They ruled the earth. They were supposed to be fruitful and multiply and they had all the food they could eat except for eating from one tree. Adam and Eve had the attributes of significance, acceptance and security. That's what Tove refers to. See, you know why I call it an attribute? Because it's something you have that you don't even have to try to have. It's already there. Like I think about my right arm or my nose or my legs, right? I have them. I don't often think about my arm or my nose or my legs. I just use them. See, attributes are things that sometimes even when you have them, you take them for granted. Tov, flourishing, no concern, no desire, no need to feel significant, accepted, and secure because they already were those things until Genesis 3 happens. And then everything changes. And therein lies the beginning seeds of the source of what you and I have to resist today. Check this out. You'll notice how different things become, how Tov sh uh, quickly uh, shifts away and fleets itself from Adam and Eve. If you know the story, you know that the serpent comes and he tempts Adam and Eve and they eat from the fruit. It's not an apple, by the way. It's just a piece of fruit. That's all we know of in scriptures. Yet so many times we picture it as an apple. I feel like we're giving apple a bad rap, but, but no, it's a piece of fruit and they eat it and then, then boom, everything changes. Look at Genesis chapter three, beginning in verse seven and notice how differently Adam and Eve respond. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and now they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife, they went and hid themselves, very different from before, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. See, they had never been afraid before. And now all of a sudden they are. Now they know that they are naked and they hide themselves. Notice what they do even further. It's a very different like, like scene unfolding here. He said, who told you you were naked? That's God. He said, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Notice what the man does. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree. Do you notice how quickly he blames and then I ate of it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? Notice what the woman does, the serpent. It was the serpent who deceived me and I ate. Do you notice the change of actions and reactions of Adam and Eve? You see, all of a sudden when sin entered the world, when they disobeyed God, something happened to their attributes. All of a sudden their attributes of significance and acceptance and security they instantly became needs. Do you notice they noticed that they were naked and they felt insignificant? So they had to kind of perform and cover that up because they didn't want to be embarrassed and, and seen that way. Do you notice they were used to walking with God and they were accepted by God and all of a sudden they felt like, like what, what are we going to do here? And so they, they hide from him. It's like this attempt to, to control the scenario and, and restore this sense of, of acceptance from God by blaming someone else and, and being blame free, right? God, it wasn't me, it was someone else. And you notice these human attempts, they're very natural for us today, aren't they? Like, isn't it real easy when you and I feel insignificant or unaccepted or insecure? to just try and perform more or please more or control more. You see what's going on here? Their attributes now became needs. And everything that they were used to was now gone. Herein lies the source of attack that you and I experience still to this day. I like to say it this way, the missing sense of significance, acceptance, and security are the areas where we most likely must resist the devil's temptations. It happened way back in the beginning and still persists today. 
Let me give you an example to help make sense of this. Do you ever think about social media today in our world? doesn't matter what platform, just, just social media in general. I think like deep down in our souls, we would say like something is off with social media. It's, it's gone a little bit far. It's probably being abused. Maybe it's not the best thing for all of us to be on. And yet it's so irresistible, isn't it? Like, I, I don't know what else in all of history have, has captivated the attention and, and, and priority of, of so many different people, like, like spanning generations upon generations. 10-year-olds to 90-year-olds still use social media today. Do you ever think about why? Like, why is that so true? Even when, like I said, deep down in our souls, we know it's a bit out of control. We know it's a bit more than we should be participating in. Hey, just as a side note, when it comes to social media, like, like I don't know if we realize this, but when it comes to our kids and social media, there is study after study after study that would say that our teenagers, our, our preteens, and even our older teenagers, they have not yet developed the maturity to handle the power that social media brings to this world. You know that when it comes to social media, parents, like it doesn't have to be a culturally pressured decision to participate in social media. No, no, we're called to live differently. We are called to prayerfully consider what we allow our eyes and our hearts to be consumed with. Going one step further, I know right now, if you were there and you were feeling like, maybe, maybe this isn't so good. Maybe we need to change. Maybe, maybe not even just my kids need to change. Maybe I need to make a change. Listen, listen, the train has not yet just left the station. Like things aren't already out of the barn. The horses aren't out of the barn or whatever other phrase you wanna, wanna throw in there. God is a master at redeeming and restoring what is lost and broken. And he can help us put things back together and reset boundaries and restore expectations in a way that is healthy and more flourishing, more tove for our soul and our households. Back to my original thought, this idea that social media represents everything we're seeing in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. You know why I think social media is so powerful and so irresistible today? Think about it. Social media is a place of instant significance. If you feel insignificant, if you feel unvalued, what do you do? You go post something, you go say something and you sit back and just count the likes. And it's beautiful. Instantly you're popular. Instantly people love you. Instantly you get to feel a little bit of affirmation and it's good. And that, that feeling, that longing for significance, it sort of just goes away. And the opposite is true too, right? You want instant significance. You want to like feel that again. You want to restore a bit of that in your life. Just go look at people's posts and, and like, what do we do? We, we make fun of their train wreck of a life so we can feel better about our lives. And somehow, some way in doing so, it makes significance return to our hearts. Sometimes we post controversial things to just sit back and watch the anger and the frustration and the debate unfold. And we feel like we're doing a good thing because we're causing people to debate and discuss things. But are we really discussing? Or are we just arguing? Not only is social media a place of instant significance, it's also a place of instant acceptance. Like we don't really post most times what we really, truly, and honestly think. No, we post what we think people want to hear. Like we don't, we don't speak the truth on social media. We speak what's popular. Social media is this place where we go on and we like everything possible because we think if we don't like it, they're not going to like me. It's this giant playground of pleasing people over and over and over again. It's a place where we can connect with celebrities and, and groups that we want to be associated with so we can sort of feel like we know them and they know us. But is it really even reality? Social media is a place of instant significance. It's a place of instant acceptance. And it's a place of instant security. Think about it. On your social feeds, you're the editor-in-chief. You're in charge. You put the filter on. You take the picture down if it doesn't get enough attention. You choose the right lighting. You could have the worst day in the world as a parent with your kids. It could be an awful day, but if you just catch one snapshot of your kids smiling or hugging and you post that, man, people think you're just a great parent, don't they? And all of a sudden you're in control and you remove any bit of uncertainty or doubt about your parenting skills. See, that's what social media is. 
It's this false sense of reality that deep down, even though we feel like it might not be good for us or it might not be the best thing for our kids and maybe we should take a break from it, somehow, some way, it keeps drawing and, and luring us in. And that's how deep and far reaching the curse and the effects of Genesis chapter 3 are. You see, we so deeply long for significance. We so deeply long to feel accepted. We so deeply long to control things and feel certainty again in our lives and feel secure in who we are with everything raging on around us that we will blow by our moral convictions. We will blow by the voice of the Holy Spirit in our life and we'll keep participating in things because we feel it satisfy that missing need. This is where the enemy attacks us. This is what he does. He takes our longing, our missing sense of significance, acceptance, and security, and he tempts us to fill them in ways apart from God. You know what I think the Bible would describe social media as? Something that we read about in Jeremiah known as a broken cistern. Check this out. If you're familiar with the book of Jeremiah, you know that he was a prophet who wrote at a very, very tumultuous time for, for the kingdom of Judah. It was tumultuous politically and spiritually and morally, and things were, things were just a wreck. And if you would know the history for that kingdom, eventually they, they got taken over and, and moved into exile in Babylon. And at the time of Jeremiah's writing, at this very, very difficult, challenging season where people weren't really following God, he spoke on behalf of God to call them back to their first love, to help them understand that flourishing and tov would never be found in the things of this world. Here's what Jeremiah writes on behalf of God. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water. Pay attention and hold on to that phrase. We're gonna come back to that in just a bit. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. See, I, I think the word cistern to us feels like maybe, maybe I just made that up. That's not something that's normal in our world or in our culture. But back then, this was something so vital to the life of a community. You see what it was? It was a protected place in the ground, basically a dugout hole in the rock. You can take a look at the picture. You can see it like, like this is where they stored their water. This is like in an arid culture, in a desert scenario, water was the source of life. You protected it. You lived near it. You guarded it. You made sure it was working because if you didn't have water, you weren't going to live very long. It was the very wellspring for a community. And what God is saying through Jeremiah is you're trying to do things in this world and they're not holding water. They're not making you feel significant for very long, are they? Acceptance might come for just a moment, but then it's gone so quickly, isn't it? And for about an hour, you feel secure, but then another fear comes up, doesn't it? Broken cisterns. My people have committed two sins. You know what sin often is? It's something that we look at and we say, well, that's when we disobey God. That's when we miss the mark. That's when we fall short of a standard that we read about in the scriptures. And yes, those are all true. If that's your working definition of sin, I would say, yes, it is, it is accurate. But the more I understand the missing tove in this world, the more I understand how the devil attacks and tempts me personally, the more I understand how deep and pervasive I long for significance, acceptance, and security in this world, the more I think differently about my own definition of sin. You see, to me, you know what sin is? Sin is when I try to meet a legitimate need, but I do so in illegitimate ways. I, I do it in ways that are distant from God. Sin is trying to meet a legitimate need, like this, this missing sense of significance, like, like this missing sense of acceptance. You can't find out where you belong in this world. You feel like everything is uncertain and it's out of control and you feel insecure. It's those things, they're, they're legitimate needs. They were, they were gone during the curse in Genesis 3, but we try to fill them in illegitimate ways. You see, you know what, you know what greed and lust and revenge and overspending and overeating. You know, what, you know what gossip and immoral relationships and extramarital affairs, you know what lying 
and cheating and slandering and, and being stingy and turning your nose up at people and, and having pride. You know what all those things are? They're broken cisterns that won't hold water. There are fleeting attempts to reestablish Tove and to flourish in this world and they never last. And it's precisely the root of what we must resist. You see, when I look at my own sin, the sin I have committed in the past, the sin I am still tempted to commit in this world, and yes, sometimes I still do, sometimes more than I want to admit, right? The sin in my life, the deep down stemming of it and seed and genesis of it is from me longing to feel more significant longing to gain more acceptance in this world, longing to feel more secure with everything going on around me. And I'm guessing the same is true for you too. See, the root of what we must resist is our temptation to try and feel significant acceptance and security through anything outside of our identity in Jesus Christ. You see, here's what I'm driving at today. To resist the devil, so that he'll flee from us, we have to know the very root of what we're resisting. And it's this missing sense of significance, acceptance, and security. But we have to see things even more clearly than that. We have to understand that they're not just needs we have. They're an identity that must be restored. Truth be told, Jesus is the only one capable of giving us that tove kind of an identity. And to see our temptations in this world this way, we've got to look and fix our eyes on Jesus. John, in his gospel account in chapter four, he describes this, this amazing moment between Jesus and a Samaritan woman at a well. And it's, it's the middle of the day, right? They're in a, like I said, an arid culture. It's hot. And so water is just, it's just so important. And you gotta understand at noontime, no one goes to get water then. You, you typically go when it's cooler, early in the morning or, or late at night when the sun is down. But, but if you go get water at noontime, you're going because no one else is there. You've got something to hide. You feel insignificant. You feel insecure. You long for acceptance in this world. And we know and read about this exchange between Jesus and this Samaritan woman. We know that Jesus, you know, he's Jewish and he's not supposed to interface with Samaritans, yet Jesus does. Jesus breaks all the boundaries because he just loves all of us. And he talks with her and he identifies and, and communicates that he knows her past, that she's had five husbands. And the man she's with now, that's not her husband today. And, and Jesus goes on and, and says more to her. And hey, hey we got to understand this, what Jesus is pointing out. It's one of the most common broken cisterns we all turn to. Come on, who among us hasn't turned to a relationship to make us feel more significant or more secure and we cross moral boundaries and we go further and do more things and, and say more things and become a version of ourselves we never wanted to be just to gain that relationship because we think it'll make us feel significant, accepted or secure. And that's what this woman was doing. And here's what Jesus says to her. He said, everyone who drinks of this water, referring to that well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him, there's that living water picture from Jeremiah, right? He will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will be a spring of water welling up to eternal life. See, here's the deal. You know what Jesus is saying? That longing for significance, acceptance, and security, that thirst that we have deep down inside of us that we try to satisfy and quench in so many ways through all the temptations that the devil brings to our world, it can only be quenched in Jesus himself. You see, Jesus offers us when we follow him, when we surrender to him and place our trust and our faith in him as the leader of our life and the forgiver of our sins, what he places upon us is a brand new God-given perfect identity. We become in Christ and we become satisfied then. See, the identity we long for deep down inside that will quench our thirst for significance, acceptance and security, it is placed on us. It's never based on us. So here's what we're gonna learn as we uncover more and more about these words and this idea of how do we resist the devil? We're gonna understand that in Christ, 
we already are significant. In Christ, we already are secure. There's no need to control. There's no need to chase a, a broken cistern of performing for everyone so they'll applaud you. There's, there's no need to try and please people because in Christ, we're already accepted just as we are. So what are you thirsty for? Like where does the devil tempt you most? What's that, what's that sort of drink of water that you long to sip and to swallow so it will satisfy that thing that wells up so often in your life? Are you thirsty to feel significant? Are you thirsty to feel more accepted in this world? Is, is rejection the thing you taste all the time and you just want to get that taste out of your mouth? Do you long for security? Is fear driving most of what you do so that, so that you just want to control everyone around you, the way you parent, the way you look and, and what people say about you and it's just driving you because you're afraid of what will happen if I don't have control? What are you most thirsty for? See, the only way to satisfy that is with living water found in Jesus himself. And the way we resist the devil is yes, we know how he targets us, but even more so than that, we find our identity in Jesus and no broken cistern that this world can offer. What are you most thirsty for? Let's pray together. Jesus, we long to be people who look just like you. God, we, we don't we don't want to thirst any longer. And God, that that quest to to, to remove the, the sense of insignificance and the sense of insecurity and the sense that we don't belong, God, it, it is maddening to us. Lord, would you heal us from the inside out? Or would you open our eyes to the root of our own temptations in our own lives so we can better learn how to stand against the devil when he comes? Jesus, thanks for promising us victory. Thanks for being living water. May we only drink from you and nothing else. God, I ask as we navigate this series, as we, as we reach down into the depths of our own story and our own souls, God, would you heal us and help us to realize just how victorious we truly are in Jesus' name. Lord, thanks for making a way even when it feels like there isn't one. We love you. We praise you. We worship you, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.